Hey, good morning and welcome to Common Ground. My name is Caleb and I'm going to be leading worship this morning. If you guys would stand and sing with us, uh, we're going to worship our King. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Sing that again. We were the beggars. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We worship the God. Was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of Lord. There's joy in the house of Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung upon that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't buy it. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. And now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. And now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise.
the power of sin and darkness Whose love is mighty and so much stronger The King of glory, the King above all the whole earth with holy thunder and leave us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all things this is amazing grace this is a very love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king above all kings who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of his brilliance the king of glory the King above all kings Yeah, this is amazing grace This is a failing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy, worthy, worthy oh, This is amazing grace This is a failing love that you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me
thy glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me And oh, how he loves us so Oh, how he loves us How he loves us I thought the capo was on the wrong fret. Better to stop there than to keep going. Oh, I heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. 
but I heard the tender whisper of the love in the dead of night and you tell me that hope these days that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am it's who I am oh I Seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know that we're all searching for answers. Only you go by, cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. Who you 
are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am You are perfect in all of the ways You are perfect in all of the ways You are perfect in all of the ways To us You are perfect in all of the ways You are perfect in all of the ways perfect moment you have created we know that this is of your doing the weather the friends around us the people who are joined here together we're all coordinated by you to be here in this moment we ask for your abiding grace may your spirit move deeply here and in us may we have ears to hear the message today we are just excited to honor you and bless you Amen, amen. Go ahead and have a seat, y'all. This is just recognizing the goodness of the Father in our lives and in our hearts today as we move into a time of communion, um, knowing that he sits at the table. I love to emphasize that idea of the banquet table that we see as the Passover is being given, uh, and Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper in that moment as both the reminder to us of this moment and then the future banquet table. If you haven't grabbed the communion elements, they're, tab- they're placed on the tables, the small tables in the back, and you can go ahead and do those right now. I want to read today from Matthew 26, verse 26 through 30. It says, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples. He said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for you, for the many, for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. As we observe communion this morning, let us be reminded of this, of the sacrifice that Jesus has given for us and his replacing of us and taking on the burden of our sin. After a moment of reflection, I just want to invite you, by eating the juice and the bread, you partake in a tradition that has taken place across the world for many, many generations. Anyone who calls himself a follower of Jesus may partake. The table is open. Thank you. 
Hey y'all, my name is Sam Linetti. I'm the formation pastor here at Common Ground Northeast. Here we don't believe that we attend a church or go to a church, but that we are the church, that we carry the kingdom wherever we go, whether it's in our neighborhoods where we live, in the places where we work or where we play. Uh, this week I wanna highlight a, a great opportunity for all of us to jump on board with this week, Tuesday from 2 to 7 p.m., that's October 5th, we're having a blood drive on our campus uh, in partnership with the Red Cross. Y'all, this is an amazing thing that God has clearly orchestrated. Uh, God's been moving through our congregation, um, compelling our people to jump on board, to give life-giving blood in a blood shortage right now. And it saved some lives, y'all. If you haven't heard some of the stories behind some of the ways in which the blood drives that God brought the opportunity here for us to partner with the Red Cross, uh, and the ways in which it's impacted and saved lives, it's phenomenal. And so, y'all, we've got another one coming up on Tuesday, uh, October 5th from 2 to 7 p.m. If you haven't signed up, make sure you do. If you've given blood before, thank you. Let's do it again. If you've never given blood before, come through our doors. We'll walk you through it. It's an awesome opportunity to give life-giving blood for those in need. And there's something beautiful about giving life-giving blood to others and, and tying it to the gospel in the way in which Jesus gave his blood for us as well. And so y'all, if you are interested, make sure to jump on redcrossblood.org. Um, you can search Common Ground Christian Church or you can search October 5th and find our location and uh, sign up for one of those slots. And y'all, in the past, Red Cross has given us anywhere between 40 to 60 slots to fill and we filled that up and exceeded expectations every time. This time they've given us 99 slots to fill. And last time I checked, we were only about 50 or 60 uh, filled up. So there's, there's room to take on more people. So go on, sign up, check it out, give life giving blood for others in need. And let's continue to serve our community and love God and serving our community all the while. Y'all, I love y'all. Continue to be the church wherever you go. Yes. Redcrossblood.org. Who's signed up already? I'm going to put you all on the spot right now. We got a couple, three, four, all right. I go that double red every time. There's only one way to go with that power red. Um, I want to encourage you all, just like Sam said, they have challenged us. We've exceeded our goals. Our location is prime. And so they keep saying, we, need, we, we love your location. I think they got a couple of other churches around us to help out too, um, but do know that um, this is aff literally affecting people in our congregation. And I know that, that some of you have heard the story, but just know um, that, that uh, uh, this has been a part of our communal engagement and our offering uh, to be able to partner with this during a, a literal blood crisis that's taking place because they can't, you ever, did anyone ever donate during high school, like you become a senior and you get to get out of class, Right. And maybe that wasn't your experience, that was mine, but they can't do that anymore because of COVID. That's something that got shut down. College campuses, a lot of those things got shut down. And so they're really trying to make up lost ground in terms of gaining uh, the supply of blood. So please feel free to do it. If you don't donate here, donate somewhere. Um, we're at 61 as of last night. 61 of those 99 slots have filled. So if we had our normal challenge, that trajectory would be definitely hit, but we got 99 to fit now. So let's try and get out there if you haven't done it, Red Cross Blood. Dot org. My name is Eric. If someone hasn't said welcome to you, let me say welcome. We're glad that you're here at Common Ground Northeast. If you're catching us online, we're so glad that you're doing that. You can put a little hi, hello in the chat so we can get in touch with you. I did want to point out that if you're new um, and you, and, or if you need anything from us, let me pull a little physical paper out. We do have these cards in the seat back organizer in front of you. If you're sitting in the, um, not in the front row, sorry, you all are excluded from that. But if you're new, let's get connected. If there's anything you need to be prayed for, that's the purple one. And then if there's any volunteer opportunities you'd like to jump into, the um, orange yellow one, I'm slightly color deficient. So uh, whatever color that is, it looks orangish to me. Um, fill that one out, put them in the connect card, and we'll be able to continue um, uh, walking alongside of you in that endeavor as well. Um, we have been trying to make sure that our announcements are short, and so I do want to give you the quick announcement. There's a QR code on the Seatback Organizer. It's the most obvious one right on the organizer. Um, if you want to get the details for the things that we have going on, the blood drive, other things that are happening, we have a fall festival coming up. I did want to mention that right after service, if you're interested in knowing more about Common Ground, our CG DNA class is going to be in there. All those details are on that digital bulletin just use the QR code and it'll get you all of the things and we update that every single week so that you have uh, that stuff with you. Um, all right, well, this is the time 
when we dismiss our children into their uh, classes. So let me go ahead and do that. And then I got a a little special announcement, but they can't hear. That's all y'all. Theme row. Go. I don't know what they were doing. All right, we're about to dismiss for our meet and greet, which is just a couple of minutes for you to just say hi to somebody, but i got to wait for them all to go. <laughs> Maybe, man. They know. <laughs> Donut Sunday is back, everyone. So... <laughs> I love how much joy we get out of this moment. All right, so just know we do have people watching online, and for them this is a little bit of dead space, so I'm going to say go quickly, but I might start my sermon before you get back to your seat, just as a heads up, all right? So let's go ahead and say hello to someone. If there's someone new, just say hello to them, but do go ahead and jump into the cafe, get coffee, donuts, um, whatever it is you need to sustain the rest of your time here. All right, all right. I am going to go ahead and start kind of getting everyone called back in. There's still a few people getting donuts. Don't let me hold you back from your donuts. Just leave it, yeah. You're good. <clears throat> All right, as you make your way back to your seats, I'm going to go ahead and jump in. And we are finishing out a series that we started probably three weeks ago that we are calling We Are Common Ground. And the heart of this series really was just to, on this side of COVID, with the amount of flexibility we've had to have, with all of the things that have gone on and changed inside of our church outside of COVID, but including that in this last season, just starting to say, who are we before we jump into whatever we feel like we're called to do next? That there are some core kind of values that anchor us to being our identity as common ground as a church. And before uh, COVID hit, the elders were walking through just a process of identifying what are our core values. And we got a few of those um, nailed down, and we still have a couple, maybe one or two, that we're still trying to work on. Um, But the idea was just what are these cultural values that, that, that make us who we are? And the first one was we are common ground, meaning we choose to seek common ground amongst a wide array of traditions, liturgical, theological expressions, and denominational structures within the accepted community of historically orthodox Christian churches. The second one is we empower. So we are common ground and then we empower. Meaning this, instead of a top-down structure of ministry, whenever possible, we want to leave by handing off authority and empowering others, giving away power in order to engage our congregation with ministry and with marginalized people groups in the world. 
And so we are common ground, more than just a name, it's a description of who we are. We empower, and we are courageous, meaning we're willing to take some risks when we feel called to do something, to be bold when God places a face step in front of us, and to say yes to kingdom work that maybe others would tend to say no to in the midst of their um, ministry convictions. And so this is where we're at. This is how far the elders have gotten. Again, we're going to work out a couple more, but what I wanted to do with the last couple sermons in this series was to, one, make an observation that I have had kind of coming from the outside in and and looking at the the culture of common ground and what we have created ourselves to be, and I believe that it contributes to part of our identity. And the second one is to call us next week to consider our own commitments to one another as a church body and as we move out of COVID and build on to what's next, just to kind of set aside a time. Every once in a while, it's good just to be like, all right, I'm good here. I'm, I'm, this is who I am. This is where we're at. We believe in these values and we are committed to being here. And so we'll talk about that next week. My observation for today is this. We seek the kingdom. We seek the kingdom. Now, there was a time that was very popular for a while, ministry paradigms, often to under-resourced communities or the houseless population, and it would look something like this. We want to help you. We have things that we can give you. We got clothes. We have a meal cooked just for you. There's toiletries and hot water, showers. We got socks. We got backpacks. Anything else you need, we'll even create a bus ministry that will go send out a fleet of vehicles to pick you up, bring you here, but... There's a but. The one thing we need you to do is you got to sit through an hour-long sermon and a 40-minute altar call if you want access to all of those things. Has anyone seen this before? And maybe you're more familiar with the youth group version, right? We got a lock-in. We got pizza. We got dodgeball. The band is going to be rocking. And most of all, students, your parents are not invited, right? The big, like, come on, let's do this. And then right at midnight, you hit them with an hour sermon and a 40-minute altar call. I was falling asleep during that time. (laughs) Like, wait, why did you wait till midnight to do this right now? Now, I told you about my friend uh, who was in an apartment ministry called Apartment Life. We were were, um, uh, a team, CARES team is what they called it. And we had this clubhouse with kids, and as the kids would graduate out of the clubhouse, uh, out of the club scenario, we would make them leaders. And then eventually, sometimes we would invite them to come and be a part of the youth ministry that I was a part of during that time that I was leading. And so some of our student leaders were asked, they were invited. I don't, how many of you guys know what in and out is? Are you guys familiar with in and out Is that just a random name? It's just like a popular West Coast um, burger place. And there was one in Phoenix. And they said, and I remember this kid, his name was Oscar. He was uh, probably fifth grade-ish. And we're like, hey, it's time to go to in and out He's like, no, I'm not going. I'm like, what do you mean you're not going, man? Oscar, he's like, dude, I remember what happened last time. I'm like, Oscar, what happened last time? He's like, and he points to my, my, my CARES team coordinator, the other one. He's like, last time we went, he said, let's go to in and out We jumped into the car like four or five of the leaders. And he says, I just got to take a quick stop before we get there. And he took us to the Wednesday night service at their church. <laughs> And then they went to get burgers, so he technically didn't lie. But I'm like, Tony, you just kind of kidnapped those children. And he's like, yeah, but brother, I kidnapped them in Jesus' name. I'm like, Tony, you can't do that ever again while I'm on this CARES team right now. It's like this classic bait-and-switch model that was utilized for a generation or two or three, right? And I understand the ministries meant well, right? We, we don't, we, they, it wasn't like some sort of, uh, uh, um, a, uh, I don't know, it wasn't intentionally trying to be deceitful. And I'm being critical to some extent because I participated in ministries that did things like this, right? So I'm not even pointing the finger. It's more like me kind of looking back at the history of ministry paradigms and thinking, maybe that one was not quite like the way it should have been. And something now doesn't sit well when conditions of this kind of nature, right, are added to caring for people or works of compassion, or serving those in need and ministering to people. And so what I want to do is open up the scriptures to you, to Matthew 25. I think there's some insight that we can gain from the way Jesus uh, uses this story that he tells. Matthew 25, we're going to do 31 through 46. If you open your Bibles, you can do that there. We'll have the verses up on the screen for you um, as usual. Verse 31, Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, He will sit on his glorious throne. Catch that image, right? When the Son of Man comes in all his glory and on all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. The royal imagery, authority built into that. 
All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people, one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since, you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous one will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did you see the stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see the sick or in prison and go to visit? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. See how equivalent he's making himself with them. Then verse 41, it says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger in need of clothing or sick or in, need, or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to the eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. All right, so this is, uh, there's some intensity to this, right? And on the right-hand side, there are sheep, right? And on the left-hand side, sorry for those of you who chose my left-hand side today, but you're the goats for now, for the time being. And, and he, and he kind of has this two-body idea, and a separation is occurring which places a reward on some and a consequence on others. Now, what I want you to know is I'm aware that there are end times implications to this, but that's not what we're teaching today. All right, that's not what I'm here to do. What I want to point out here is that the focus of the commentary on the application that it presents to us today in the here and now, because the judgment described in here is meant to put an emphasis or an exclamation point on the importance of a kingdom principle, which has implications for the way we serve and the way we see humanity, which is this. What are we doing with the resources God has given us? What are we doing to serve others? But more importantly, what is our heart posture in the midst of all of the things we do to engage the world around us. And in the story that the king provides in this explanation of the separation, he says one group called sheep were blessed. They will receive an inheritance because they gave food and drink, because they invited the stranger, because they clothed the naked, because they looked after the sick and visited the prisoner in prison. And the other group called goats, and I want to hear this repetition, right? Let's get these internalized. They will depart from God because they neglected to give food and drink to those in need, invited, did not invite the stranger, They did not clothe the naked. They did not look after the sick. They did not visit the prisoner. But I want us to dig a little bit further down into the depths of what's going on here. Because if you caught it, the the idea of the Imago Dei, the, the image of God was deeply sewn into the story that God, that Jesus, was giving us. It deeply represented in the humanity that was described inside of Jesus' words. Jesus equivalates himself with those in need. More than that, Jesus, or I guess I should say in addition, Jesus conveys his very presence through those in need. And so if you want to see the face of God, don't go to a church building. Don't go to grand cathedrals. I was overseas one time, and it was this interesting thing where um, I I was standing in front of this, it was called the Basilica. I can't remember the full name of it. But they actually took my passport when I entered the gates because they said this place represents the Vatican. And so by walking into this geographic place, you have... You have walked into the Vatican, and I need to take your passport because you're leaving this country. Like, that's kind of an odd thing to say. This representation fully, fully represented a completely different geographic location here in this place. And it was beautiful. 
And we walked around and we saw the statues and it was so high. I mean, it was like, like I, you could see it from afar and still not fathom how giant this place. And, and, and the, the, um, the artwork that was all around and I loved it. And what I want you to see is that if you want to see the face of God, you can get a taste of it there. But Jesus just told us, go to your local shelter and look into the face of the poor person and you will be looking into my eyes. Go to your local hospital and look into the eyes of the cancer patient. Go to the clinic and look into the eyes of an addict. Go to the prison and look into the eyes of the captive because God is there. And those who look into their eyes are looking into the very eyes of God, the very presence, just like this cathedral I was in. The presence of God himself is found in the presence of those who are in need. And so serving those in need is like serving Christ himself. Now we could just stop there, meditate on that, and be done for today. You're not going to get that lucky. I've got a few more things to say. But stop and understand how insane that is. The fullness of God represented, the eyes of God conveyed through the hurting, the broken. And it is interesting that both parties in this parable are surprised. In our preaching collective, we talked about this idea that the sheep cared for Jesus without even knowing it because they cared for people in need. And the goats didn't care. They neglected Jesus because they neglected the people that were in need. But at the end of both of their time, they said, wait, God, when did we see you? When did we not see you? And they were surprised with their inheritance on the other side. The kingdom principle that I want you to really see below this surface that's being sown is that it's not that your good works earn you a place into heaven. You can't get yourself, you can't do enough things, you can't be a doer of good deeds and make your way into the kingdom of God. It's just the kingdom of God is so internalized within you that it can't help it overflow into your actions. You are a kingdom person by identity and it is clear by the things that you do. So if we're a participant in the kingdom and the works of the kingdom here, we will be a participant in the one in the age to come. And so it's less a division by the things that they do and more a division of what they are made of. And what they are made of is realized, is revealed, sorry, by what they do. Do you see the difference there? Because I think that's an important thing that we have to see inside of this. One commentary I heard said it kind of humorously like this. Sheep do sheep things. Goats do goat things. And they will be separated in kind. Likewise, kingdom people do kingdom things. And they will be recognized by their deeds. And so our goal is not simply to just be busy doing good deeds, but to internalize that and become kingdom people so that our deeds and our, and, and, our, and our actions are an outpouring of this king that we interact with on a regular basis. It's a part of our identity and who we are. We are kingdom people, and our deeds become that evidence, our affiliation with the kingdom of heaven. So take that reorientation, kind of get your hearts and your minds there. What kind of deeds do kingdom people do? Well, it gives us the example, right? Food and drink are given to those in need. They invite the stranger. They clothe the naked. They look after the sick and visit the prisoner. The Faith Life Commentary said this, the actions described here reflect obedience to, command, to the command to love one's neighbor and thereby demonstrate love for God as well. It's, it's really that simple. We have all of these examples given to us, and I don't want to let anyone off the hook. I listened to one commentary that said, well, if you give money to your church and your pastors do these things, then basically you did it. Not true. All right, we are equippers and we want to empower you. And I'm not saying you have to live in the fear of saying, well, I don't know, I haven't gone to visit someone in prison in a really long time. Maybe I should get about that because 
If that's what one of the, the kingdom things is to do, I've got to do that. I do think that this is a sample, a tasting, is saying, hey, these are the kinds of things, and some of these are very uh, over and above and beyond what the normal person would have done in that time. And so the idea is we're going to take love that far. We're going to take the way we treat people further than others might take it. And so we're going to invite them maybe at the cost of things that we have. We're going to clothe them maybe at the cost of not having two cloaks myself. We're going to look after the sick. We are going to visit the prisoner and we are going to obey the command to love your neighbor as yourself. And they're tangible examples of the types of things required of us to fulfill the law of God. All of the law and the prophets can be hung on this one thing. To love your neighbor as yourself. To love the Lord your God with all your heart. To love your neighbor as yourself. I want you to see that both of these services represent acts of service but they also have a representation of justice issues. The descriptions given here, as you read through them, you can almost kind of say, yeah, that's more like service, that's helping out, that's caring, compassion. But justice takes a little bit of a different change in heart, right? That's where you say, hey, what is causing people to be sick and how can I make that stop? That's you placing yourself in between, like we said before, the person collecting stones and the accused and saying, hold on. Let's, 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 let's deal in this. Let's, let's step into this on their behalf. And so Jesus' remarks in this are justice and they are service acts. And kingdom people are about this life that extends all of this to the least of these. Jesus' remarks here call for a Christian care to reach all the way to the bottom of whatever social structure you might be operating in and inverts the earthly values that have made those in the first place. And so it's possible you witnessed a Christianity at some point in your life where communities in the West like ours tend to have a strong emphasis on cognitive understanding, on reading the scriptures and knowing things that are in here, on memorization, theological understanding, getting systematic theologies internalized so that you can pull them out whenever you need to, but often at the de-emphasis of doing any of it, Right? That's kind of the obvious critique that happens in Western churches. Many denominations tend to do lots of good study work, exegesis within these walls, but fail to bring it outside and into the streets. There's a gap there. And so small groups will meet for years and do Bible studies and hang out, which are great things, but don't go on mission together or serve at all. We can be completely content in our culture. It has given us permission to do so. Consume doctrines. Memorize verses, theologies, and pursue knowledge without ever doing any of it. It's like we read the Ikea instruction, but we don't put together whatever the thing is that we've been given to put together. And so it remains in pieces scattered on the floor as we scratch our heads and say, well, give me another uh, instruction booklet. What good is the instruction booklet if we don't do anything with it? And this is one of the major pushes of, you've heard of the missional movement and one of these kind of uh, ideas that has arisen to say in America, man, we need to get to work, we need to get out there, we got to do more than just say things and read about things and more than just teach, more than just care for one another. We actually need to get beyond our walls and be in the world but not of it, right? We've got to get to work and roll up our sleeves. And, and one of the common things that we've said here is often the people gifted with service are sitting in these seats like, yeah, I know, but when are we going to do these things? And then they go start nonprofits so they can get something done. Or they just get frustrated. Like, how many times can we do the book of John in our small group before we actually take that verse on this page and say, let's go out there and do it? And many of us grew up in certain pockets of Christianity who pulled the bait and switch, like I mentioned before. Added requirements and undue conditions in front of God's love that he gives freely, service to others and meeting needs, all came at this first say, like, if you do this for me, then we'll get here. If you do that, if you can jump through this hoop, then I can give you some food. Food. Conditions that God himself does not add. And so one of the things that I am so proud to say about this church, we aren't that. We are not that. I love that I don't have to spend much time trying to convince our leaders 
to go do things. I love, it is a delight to me that we willingly serve schools and communities and those in need. I love that when there's a new opportunity that arises in our culture and we don't have it in our budget, they say, just put it in front of people anyways and let's see what happens. I love that when we put out an email or a call to find out what things can be done in our community, people have ideas. We desire, we haven't arrived, I don't ever want to be that uh, prideful, even, even in, in, in our own community, Right? But we have this desire to seek the kingdom and we're hungry for more. People are often coming to me like, what else are we going to do? Like, <laughs> I don't know. What, I mean, what other ideas are there? What, what, what ways do you have? There's this clear way to me that, that peop, uh, one day when somebody asked me this question, what kinds of things does your church do for mission and outreach? I'm like, oh, well, we, we serve a group called Outreach Downtown that serves homeless youth. We have All Worthy of Love. We have Care Portal. We do blood drives now on a pretty regular basis. We help freedom schools during the summer. We have this ministry to Uganda. We've done overseas trips to Puerto Rico. We have some missionaries in Mexico, right? right now. And it was like, I know there's more. I just can't think of them yet. And they're like, no, no, no. That's like good. The fact that you just rattled off eight things out of nowhere. I wasn't expecting you to be prepared to even answer that question, but out of nowhere, just bam, bam, bam. And I was disappointed that I couldn't give the full comprehensive understanding of all the missional things that we have our arms wrapped around. And I said, no, no, no. That's like, we're good. You, that, we hit enough marks. I know you guys care about people outside of your church. And so I love that I get to say, Common Ground Northeast, we have a desire to seek the kingdom. Don't you love that? And we want to be a kingdom that seeks, or sorry, a community that seeks the kingdom and does the work of God. A kingdom that loves like Jesus freely, and we don't do it with added requirements. We don't do it without making people jump through hoops and in order to just be considered and treated as humans. Without reciprocation, I mean, I'm thinking of things even in my mind now, families and schools that benefit from our house churches being generous that we don't even know about until we hear the story on the other side of it, sometimes with no recognition at all. And so this is my encouragement to us as a church. I think this is a part of our identity. We do seek the kingdom, but let's keep doing more. There are good works that the kingdom has called us, that God has called us to engage in. There's new ideas popping up. We've been spending some time over at the apartment complex here, the, the um, Lake Castleton. There's some ideas of partnering with the North Shadeland Alliance and some things that they have going on. There's still more to do that God has called us to engage in and even more on this earth to be done until there is no one left hungry, naked, thirsty, hurting, uninvited, sick, or in prison. There is more to do and to accomplish on this earth. We see it, we know it's out there, and I pray that we grow in our kingdom representation. But I do want to say I have one concern. Uh, and I'm using this phrase that I borrowed, I've used it before. We have accidentally, possibly, if it can be done, swung the pendulum and become more concerned with philanthropic services at times, which are the good deeds of the kingdom. It is kingdom work, but we forget the king in the midst of it. I fear at times that we have de-emphasized our devotion to God through the study of scripture, spiritual disciplines. We've relinquished at times the importance of truth. We struggle to evangelize at times. Instead, we run to acts of service because it's more palatable to the world around us. Almost like we're embarrassed of that Jesus part as well. And we struggle to bring Jesus into our acts of service. If there's something to be done, I don't ever hesitate putting it in front of us. But at the moment we say Jesus needs to be a part of it, that this king needs to be enthroned in the midst of it. It's like, well, I don't want to, we don't want to be too churchy. I don't want to like, I mean, that's a little too preachy. I don't know about that. And as I think of this identity that I believe is something good that is unique about us in the midst of a Western context, I wonder what identity does it kind of create around our life? And if we could see the evidence of what this makes us on the other side, is it possible that we have syncretized or come into alignment with the popular culture around us, which looks like this, secular and increasingly post-Christian. They aren't sure about this whole Jesus thing, but as long as the church does good things, I'm good with it, and we'll even help out here and there. It looks good for my giving profile. 
It resembles the kingdom, but it's marked by the idea that we get to pick and choose all of our favorite things out of Christianity and say, I want this, I want that thing, and the spiritual beliefs and the values that we hold to create this patchwork quilt religion that suits our preferences without us realizing it looks like our values, and it likely accommodates our sins in the midst of it, right? And so when, in fact, there is no kingdom, I want you to hear this. There is, no G- there is no kingdom if there is no Jesus enthroned on it. And our mission statement says we invite all people, regardless of age, ethnicity, background, to be formed into the image of Jesus, not to form him into the image of humanity or our wavering cultural values whenever we happen to do that. And so I want us to dig deeper into this kingdomness, not hand it off, not let go of it, not try to pendulum swing another way, Not go back to requiring that people sit through hour-long sermons and 40 minutes of stuff just to get a hot shower on a Sunday morning. My hope is not this like disciplinary course correction. It's this fear that I have in us that the zeal for good works might find us running into the arms of another king and a different kingdom. And if it's not Jesus, something sits on that throne. And I'm not trying to serve any other kings. I hope you're not either. And make no mistake, if you sit with these things long enough, if Jesus isn't there, there is a counterfeit something sitting on that throne and an empire that will eventually reveal itself to be a kind of pharaoh in one way or another. And in its streets, slavery. Right? When we run from one thing and go to the other, then we accidentally run into something else and into the arms of a false idol that would accept us at any cost. Jesus didn't free us to run from one false idol of Pharisaic legalism to run our, into the arms of another one. And so in our culture, it's going to be difficult because you can see almost how those things have bled into the church in our day and age. The kingship of Jesus and the works of the kingdom should work together, but it's difficult, but it's not impossible. We can fight for this. We can be those who want to stand in the gap. And I, I want us to not forget these other words of Jesus. In 836, Mark 836, it says, For what will it profit a person if they gain the whole world and lose their own soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. King Jesus established the kingdom, and then he gave us the privilege to participate in it. May we not be lured into the arms of a false suitor that claims to be our good God, but instead fight to hold these two things together. And I want us to seek more relief for those who are hurting. I want us to seek more freedom for the prisoner. I want us to seek more justice where the kingdom overflows into it. But I also want to do it while seeking truth, having fidelity to the one true God and keeping the king centered at the movement seated on the throne in our lives, all right? My, 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 so, so, so this encouragement comes with one concern, but, but this is my prayer for us. Um, and I'll pray it over us as it extends into the song that we're about to sing. We've sang this song, God of Revival, over and over, and there's a bridge that says, come and awaken our city, come awaken our people. I want this revival to be with both of these things in hand. And so as we sing these words, come awaken us, Lord. If you felt like you, maybe you still sit here and you're like, I still just struggle with the service part. Then let's pray that God would awaken that in you. Maybe you're still not sure how to translate what you read in the scriptures into something tangible on the streets. So let's pray for that. But maybe you're easily able to jump into the streets and serve, but you have struggles bringing it into the hands of Jesus who is king. And I want you to pray both of those things as we lift our hearts and our minds in the midst of this. Let me pray for us first um, as the band comes up. Jesus, thank you so much for um, you keep us centered. You keep us balanced. We, We are a people just like we have always been throughout history that will run out of Egypt and into the wilderness and say, where are you, God? Who will begin making our own gods and our own idols to worship, or even say, let me just go back to Pharaoh if I can get a little bit of meat. 
And so my prayer and the idea that energizes this issue, God, is that you would prove yourself to be better than all other things. That you would make yourself known that we would taste and see of your goodness and that we would take that with us. So Father, let us do some hard work. Let us sing out for revival. Let us, uh, let us have this prayer on our lips and that the things you have done, you can do before through us, God, but with our hearts right. So sit enthroned on our hearts today. And that we would take what we learn from you and allow it to overflow out of an identity that is grounded in who you have called us to be, the kingdom of God. We lift this up in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Would you all stand up with us? And you worshiping God this morning through the words that we sing. But know that, that, that you can respond in your giving today. If you'd like to give, you can do so through our giving box physically or go online and hit that menu at the top right. It'll give you the options to give in accordance to whatever the Holy Spirit has convicted you to be a part of. If you have any prayer needs today, you're invited to come and speak with one of us on leadership. You can also email us late, later if you have any prayer concerns and we'll circulate that around and be praying for you. And now we come before God with our voices lifted and asking God for revival. Would you sing with us this morning? We've seen what you can do, oh God of wonders. Your power has no end. The things you've done before in greater measure you will do again cause there's no prison or wall you can't break through no mountain you can't move or things above the goal there's no broken body you can't raise no so that you can save all things are possible the darkest night you can light it up you can light it up no god of revival let hope rise death is overcome you've already won no God of revival You rose in victory And now you're seated Forever on the throne So why should my heart feel What you've defeated And I will trust in you there's no prison wall you can't break through no mountain you can't move all things are possible there's no broken body you can't raise no soul that you can save all things are possible darkest night you can light it up You can light it up Oh God of revival Let hope arise Death is overcome You've already won Oh God of revival And oh God of revival your voices people church come awaken your people come awaken your people come awaken the city oh god of revival pour it out pour it out 
every stronghold will crumble. He that chains hit the ground. God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come awaken your people. Come awaken the city. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. Hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. The darkest night, you can light it up. You can light it up, oh God, a revival. Let hope arise, the death has overcome. You've already won, oh God, a revival. Come awake in your people, come awake in the city. God of revival, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. Hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come awake in your people. Come awake in the city. Oh God of revival, pour it out. Pour it out, every stronghold will crumble. Hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Would you go with that prayer? Would you go with that idea? that God would pour out his self on you and that you would take that into the streets with the king enthroned on your hearts and all the places that you go and on your workplaces, on your Zoom calls, inside of schools and in your neighborhoods. Go in the name of the Father, go in the name of the Son, and go in the name of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen.